All right, let's get kicked off. So my name's Phil Zito, and I am the founder and CEO of Building Automation Monthly. For those of you who don't know about us, uh, we do online training uh, for companies. But uh, one of the things that we do uh, as just an industry uh, kind of provider of knowledge is we run a podcast and we do webinars like this. So uh, I was sitting down the other day, and I was remembering when I was involved early on kind of in my career when I was working uh, in building service. And I remember some customers of mine having to shut down their building and they literally just went to the main breakers and turned stuff off. And it, it was bad. I mean, stuff just started breaking and then they tried to turn everything on the same way and it just wouldn't work. Nothing would come back on. Um, there were dependencies and there were IDFs and MDFs, which are basically data closets that weren't being cooled. It was just bad all around. And so I got to thinking, man, we're going to be doing that, but on a large scale. So why don't I take what I've learned? Uh, I mean, I've worked in this trade for a long time. Uh, it, you can see uh, my body of knowledge at our website, all the podcasts and articles we've done and the books I've written. But uh, I've learned a lot, and my goal here is to share that with you, give you some actionable stuff that you can do. Um, like I said, you are more than welcome to download the slide deck as well as download the building checklist. Uh, it should help you. And as always, uh, feel free to just ask any questions in the question box. So let's dive in. So preparing your building automation system for a building shutdown. In today's webinar, we're going to go through the shutdown process. Um, we're going to talk through kind of when I'm asked to shut down a building, what do I think about? What do I focus on? How do we identify equipment and settings? For a lot of you, especially on the operator side, um, you may have some really old O&M manuals that are like buried in a closet somewhere that you haven't looked at in a long time. How do you go and make sure these things are accurate? How do you identify equipment and settings? How can you work with your contractors to do backups? All these kind of things that you need to do in order to stand a building down, to power it down, to make sure it's it's not running you know, 24 seven. Uh, we're gonna talk through the types of remote monitoring, how to implement them. Uh, we're going to talk about the critical equipment process, how to discover what equipment is critical, and then you know system dependencies, things like that. Uh, we'll talk through schedules, alarms, set points for unoccupied control, and then we'll have a question and answer. So uh, that's what we're going to cover. Let's dive in. The shutdown process. So there's really five steps to shutting down a uh, building automation system. The first step begins with identifying all your equipment. The second step is going to be documenting the current state of that equipment. Third step, and this is something um, I highly recommend, and you'll find that IT groups are much more lenient on this nowadays, unless you're in government. Um, you guys, you're, you're still going to be compliant to all your InfoSec stuff. But uh, outside of that, in the commercial sector, you'll find folks are very responsive to remote monitoring. Uh, then implementing a critical equipment run plan, and then adjusting any settings and basically starting to shut stuff down. So we're going to kind of work through that. So step one, identify all your equipment. Your goal here, right? Your main focal point is to determine, one, what equipment do you have? And two, is it manually or electronically controlled? Now, when I'm talking about equipment, my focal point is going to be mainly HVAC and lighting. That's my area of expertise. Um, I definitely have an integration background, so I'm familiar with access control, with video surveillance. I'm familiar with AV systems. But when I'm thinking about what is going to use up the majority of the energy within a building and what is going to be complex from a startup perspective when we bring the buildings back online, because this is not going to last forever, um, I think about the HVAC systems and I think about the lighting systems. So we really want to get into where we have equipment. So for those of you who have seen these documents before, um, what I highly recommend is that you try to find, and I'm going to bring one document up right now. So if it sounds like I'm like talking out of the side of my head, it's because I'm looking at a different screen right now. And I want to bring this document up so that you can see it because some of you you know, some of you, you're going to be like, yeah, I've seen this before, Phil. It's obvious. Some of you have never seen these before. Um, so you're going to want to go and get your control submittals. You're going to want to get your mechanical drawings, your electrical drawings. And you're going to want to get your O&M manuals. You're going to want to get all of the documentation that you have from a previous project. And when I look at my mechanical drawings, 
The uh, main focal point I want to focus in on here is the equipment schedule. And this is where I'll start kind of grabbing the information that I have and I'll be validating this. I'll be, you know, drawing a line through it or checking whatever system works for you. Maybe you have a CMS, maybe you have a work order management system, maybe you have an asset management system. That's awesome. A lot of buildings don't. So we'll start to build our database. And you know, this could be really simple, right? You just could simply open up an Excel sheet and you could just type in, you know, system and you could type in, you know, building and floor, whatever taxonomy you want to use, whatever organizational structure you want to use, it just start building these things out. Because what we'll do is then we'll put, you know, set points, we'll put alarms, we'll start to build out basically a list. And this doesn't have to look pretty. The goal is not pretty. The goal is accurate. And so once you're doing this, right, you're working through, let me close out these other PDFs real quick. Uh, so once you're working through this, right, you're going to be using O&Ms, you're going to be doing site walks, you're going to look at submittals, you're going to go and do software scans. So maybe you bring up a building automation system and you go into that building automation system and you open it up and you start to look at the graphics. Maybe you start to look at oh, here's a device, and what points does that device have? You're basically going and gathering data. You're going to compile a list. And this is a really important point that I, I want you all to focus in on here, is keeping this list in three places, uh, one of which must be online. I really recommend Microsoft OneDrive or Google Drive because both of which have kind of native Excel built into it. OneDrive has Excel. And Google has Google Sheets. But I mean, if you can get a Gmail account, you can get access to, I think, one gig of storage for Google Drive. And you can keep your, your as builts there. You can keep your one line there. You can keep your Excel sheet that you're going to be building there. But basically, one of the places in which you keep these documents must be online. Because if somehow you got really sick and people can't get in touch with you, or somehow got lost in the building, you don't want to not be able to find all these documents. Okay, so you got the documents, right? Now you actually have to go and go a step further, and you want to document your current state of your equipment. Uh, so the worst thing that you can do is shut everything off, not have persistent set points, and next thing you know, you power everything on, and there weren't default set points, and everything's just out of control. Towers aren't controlling properly. Air handlers are hitting high safeties and just failing left and right, and all because you didn't properly document your settings. Now, this could feel a little overwhelming because you're like, what settings do I document? It, the rule of thumb basically is that if it's a common process variable set point, something like zone temp or pressure, uh, those kind of set points, those are what you want to save. Those are what you want to log. Typically, your like balancing set points, those kind of things are going to be hardwired in or hardwired, hard coded into the controls. So you don't have to worry too much about that. But what you mainly want to focus in on is getting those temperature set points, those flow set points, pressure set points. Those are the things that if you lose those, you're going to have to spend thousands of dollars to have a test and balance person come back in, rebalance your building, reset all those settings, et cetera, et cetera. So your main point here, and this is going to save you a lot of money. Like if you take one thing out of this webinar, going and documenting settings and making sure you have them somewhere is going to help you really avoid a lot of money spent on retro commissioning and retest and balance. Also, here's another big one. And this is, I'm, I'm even going to get a pen under here and kind of circle this. This is one that if you don't do this, uh, you're going to find yourself in a world of hurt. Unfortunately, the industry we're in right now, there's a lot of legacy systems and there's a lot of folks, I, I don't know any way to say this, I mean it with the utmost respect, but there's a lot of older folks who still run their building in manual. I mean, that's just the reality. That That is the truth of how a lot of buildings are run. And because of that, there are manual ways in which buildings are shut down, started, restarted, et cetera. 
And if you don't have these things documented, then you're going to really struggle to turn stuff back on. So as you turn stuff off, naturally, you're going to want to document that because then the reverse is most likely going to be how you're going to turn it on. So document your set points and go and document how you turn things on and how you turn them off. Next up is implement remote monitoring. Now, the goal here, and and this is something I, I want to point out because a lot of folks hear remote monitoring and they have this vision that they have to monitor everything in their building and they've got to do this huge expensive project and now we're talking analytics and da 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 da. All we're talking about is if you have critical systems in your building, maybe like a a packaged cooling unit or maybe you know uh, an air cooled chiller that handles process loads, whatever it is. Whatever that critical system is, and we'll talk about how to identify those in a second. Whatever that is, that's what you need to support remotely. Because right now, fortunately, we're in the shoulder months, but unfortunately, we're in the shoulder months as well. So for those of you who don't know what shoulder months are, uh, it's kind of that transitionary period between cooling or uh, rather heating to cooling. So we still can freeze. Uh, so we can't just shut everything down and hope that our plenum doesn't freeze. We can't shut everything down and hope that it doesn't get cold in our building. We still have to have unoccupied set points. We still have to have freeze protection. There's all these things that we have to still do. The best way to do this is to do some basic remote monitoring. This is where you set up like a remote VPN or you set up a cradle point or a Tossie box, et cetera. I'll be working with those companies over the next couple days or weeks to get them to create videos on how to implement their network solutions. And then I'll share those online. That way, those of you who want to implement remote monitoring, you'll kind of be able to do that. And I also suggest you work with your building contractors on doing this as well. Work with your IT, develop a plan and implement the plan. This should not be terribly difficult. Um, if IT gives you pushback, which some of them will, realize that for a lot of you, like in healthcare, obviously, um, but in you know data centers, things like that, HVAC is a business continuity and critical asset. So if IT is like, hey, we can't do this, you know, we're not going to turn monitoring on and expose our whole building just so you can maintain your air conditioning. Remind them that without the air conditioning, their servers aren't going to run. Without the air conditioning, um, you can't have a hospital, right? You, I mean, if you can't maintain pressure control within an environment with infectious disease that's airborne then uh, you're kind of got a problem. So remind your IT group that their goal is to support the business and HVAC is a business continuity reason for them to implement remote access. All right, continuing along. Implement critical equipment run plans. And, and these are just kind of cover topics right now. We are going, uh, it's different from what's being presented. Okay, someone said the PowerPoint is different. Uh, you're absolutely right. It is different. I just realized that. I made changes to this right before our presentation. I'll re-upload it, um, just so you know. I know it's different, but uh, thanks for pointing that out. I, I didn't even think about that. I uh, got a lot of stuff going on, just like all of you. So um, anyways, critical equipment run plan. Some sites, right, we're going to need to keep our equipment running. You need to know what this is. So you need to know what equipment needs to keep running, like what needs to keep running in order to keep your data closet clo uh, running, right? Or what needs to keep running to keep that wing of the building that maybe is uh, a lab wing and it's got to stay running. But the thing that I see a lot of people miss is kind of this right here. So I'm going to draw a picture. I am not an artist, so you just feel free to laugh. I can barely draw stick figures. But let's say we have an air handler, right? And let's say that this air handler is critical, right? So critical. But what also, right, this air handler, it, it has a cooling valve, right? So it has a, a cooling coil. That air-cooled chiller that's supplying that air handler is now also a critical system. That pump that supplies the water from the air-cooled chiller to the air handler is now a critical system. And this is what I see a lot of folks miss when they start to identify their critical assets is that they miss this kind of, oh, 
yeah, I know my air handler supplying that wing of the building is critical, but they don't think of the pump that supplies that air handler or the air cooled chiller, or I mean, if it's water cooled chiller, the cooling tower, et cetera. These are all things that you need to think through as you go about kind of laying out. And, and we'll talk through how this works a little bit later in the presentation. And finally, adjust your schedules, alarms, and set points. Um, you probably be kind of surprised that I put alarms in here, but when we start to talk about alarms, you'll understand why I say adjust. Because if we're going to be remotely monitoring our facilities and we haven't adjusted our alarms and everything's turned off, but your alarms think they're turned on, you're going to get deluged with just thousands of false alarms and you're not going to be able to actually pick out what is running. So the the nuisance alarms are something that are just going to kill you. So make sure that you deal with that. And we'll talk about dealing with that in just a second. But back to the top, right? Schedules. Schedules are, in my opinion, the easiest way to unoccupy your building. So because here's the deal, right? If we think about a piece of equipment, right? And this equipment has a controller, right? So it has a field controller, or maybe it's got embedded controls inside it. It will typically have a awk command, and this awk command will enable everything. Without this awk command, this piece of equipment will typically not run. And when I say awk command, I mean occupy command. So if we're able to unoccupy our buildings, right? Then what's going to happen is this piece of equipment is going to disable itself. Now, um, schedules can still trigger based on rogue zones. So what I mean by that is you can have some zones that go into a cooling or heating scenario that call for the system to go occupied. That's okay. Because remember, we're in the shoulder months right now and we don't want to freeze our plenum. We don't want to ice all of our uh, all of our piping that's in our plenum. We don't want to disable our heat trace on our condenser systems. Uh, so we do want that to happen. We do when we go below, you know, 55 degrees in the space, we do want our systems to keep, kick on and start heating. There's going to be a lot of folks who their answer to disabling their building and shutting down their building is going to be literally turning everything off. And you're going to have a lot of people who are going to freeze pipes. You're going to have a lot of people who are going to damage systems. So really your best bet, if you already have a control system in place, is to just unoccupy. Just set the schedule to unoccupancy and most of your systems should have unoccupied set points if they don't work with your controls contractor to set that up. And then, you know, at a minimum, because I don't see this lasting past summer, I mean, I'm not, uh, you know, fortune teller, but I just don't see how it would. But uh, at a minimum, have a low limit set point. You know, if it drops below 55 degrees, then kick on your heating. So we're going to adjust our set points. We've got to understand our set points, understand what will trigger what. And we also, when I say adjust our set points, uh, I'll talk through more what that looks like in just a second. But yeah, I've seen a lot of you who just joined in like the past five minutes. There will be a recording. Um, so just for those of you who just joined, feel free to ask questions in the question box. Now we're going to dive into keeping critical equipment running. All right. So critical equipment, right? It's, it's equipment that is required to maintain business continuity. That's the easiest definition of critical equipment. For you, business continuity may be keeping a, you know, a couple servers that are hosting your payment gateways. Uh, for a data center, it's going to be completely different. For a hospital, obviously, it's going to be completely different what critical equipment is. That's for you to understand your business and determine what equipment is critical in order to keep the business running. So there's another thing, which are called critical dependencies, right? And we just talked through this, um, but I'm going to do it again just because so many people just joined. And essentially what a critical dependency is, is you have an air handler, it has a cooling coil. Its job is to cool a computer room, right? So here's a here's my really bad drawing of a computer. And its goal is to keep this room cool so that the computers don't overheat. Well, the air handler running, you're like, yeah, I got this air handler running. I made sure it stays enabled. It's occupied 24-7. We're good. But then you don't occupy, you know, the air-cooled chiller 
that goes and actually cools the water. So it doesn't matter. This air handler is not going to do anything because you can only use so much free cooling. And eventually we'll get to a point where the OAT, the outdoor air temp, is too high and is not able to handle the process load inside the building. So we definitely want to understand our critical dependencies of which, you know, for this air handler, very basic example, that would be a critical dependency. Where you start to get into more complex examples are around like air pressurization, where you have a building that certain parts of it need to be pressurized, especially hospitals, and you go and maybe turn off a learning wing or whatever. I don't know why you would turn off anything in a hospital, to be honest right now, but let's say you do. Um, that could actually go and impact the entire pressurization of the building. So you need to be cognizant of not just system dependencies, but actual sequence dependencies. So if you depressurize or turn off pressurization in one part of the building, the building's a living, breathing asset. How is that going to affect the rest of the building? So here's kind of the process for going and dealing with critical equipment. And like I said, I will go and include this a little bit later. Um, I uploaded a older version of the PowerPoint. I'll upload the newer version of the PowerPoint uh, when you all start asking questions um, towards the end of this presentation. But uh, right now we're seeing, okay, step one, identify their critical, critical equipment. We already kind of went through how that works. Step two, identify the dependencies. We went through how that worked as well. Step three is determine the control method. A lot of folks don't think through this, but right now, is it going to be 24-7 occupancy? Is it just going to be occupancy based on temperature? What is going to draw drive the equipment? What is going to drive it on? And here's where you got to be careful. If you are depending on some sort of outdoor out side factor to turn these on, like spaces coming on based on occupancy, or maybe you've got an integration to an access control system. And as people badge in the building, it counts occupancy, it turns it on. These are things you need to be cognizant of because those control methods will no longer work. So you really got to think through what are my enable methods and my control methods that are going to trigger my assets to turn on. That way, if that trigger is not going to occur, like obviously it's if you're based on occupancy and a building's empty, uh, it's not a good idea to have occupancy be your trigger, like occupancy count. So you're going to have to make some changes. Another thing is identifying potential failures and developing mitigation plans. So what happens if that air cool chiller fails? What happens if that air handler fails? Do you have a way to get a rental chiller? Do you have a way to replace a fan? Do you have controllers on stock? Because I mean, right now, I don't know if you've tried to buy parts. Uh, it's not very easy to buy parts right now. So, and it's just going to get more difficult. So be aware of that. Have mitigation plans, have potential failure plans. All of you should have business continuity plans. Um, and if you don't know what a business continuity plan is, basically it's how do we continue business? So set those up, make sure you have them for these critical pieces of equipment. doesn't have to be for everything, but at a minimum for these critical pieces of equipment and then just implement everything, right? I mean, you don't want to do all this and then not implement it. So make sure that you go and you document all this, you determine your control methods, and then you implement it. And implementing can be as simple as just going into a schedule, right? We open up a schedule. We see that it's occupied all the time or right there it's occupied. And we just, you know, we set it. Uh, we could actually delete these and we could set the default value to be occupied. We could do a, a bunch of different things. So whatever you decide to do, just implement. All right, scheduling fundamentals. Hey, what, what a nice segue there. So schedule is a time-based event that commands software within controllers or pieces of equipment to turn on and off. So basically, when we are working on our schedules, which like I said, I don't know why I have put alarm in standby mode. I put this together in like three days. So there may be some typos in here and you'll just have to forgive me. Um, but that's supposed to be put alarm or schedules in the standby mode. So identify the schedules. Step one. All right. The easiest way to identify schedules is to simply go in to whatever building automation system you're using and search for schedules, right? 
So you could just search for schedules. You could go under each device and look for their schedules. There's a variety of different ways you do that. Once you have the schedule open, right? Once you identify a schedule, you open it up and you figure out, you know, what is the normal state of the schedule? Well, this one is from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we're going to document that. We're going to say, you know, maybe this is Air Handler 1. Air Handler 1 runs 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. Document this. Trust me, you do not want to have to go and try to figure all this out after the fact. Now, in an ideal world, you have three options, really, for dealing with schedules. One is to link to a global calendar event. Now, depending on what building automation system you have, you can go and set up what are called special events. And these special events, you know, you would add one and you would say for whatever time period, and you would then say, okay, it's going to be occupied 24-7 for three weeks. You know, So we're going to have three weeks of occupancy or whatever. That is one nice way to do this because by linking to a global calendar event, you're not changing your schedules. You're not going in and changing every schedule. All you're doing is taking your existing schedules, linking them to an outside event, and saying, hey... I'm going to run you 24-7, and then you delete that event after all this craziness is over, and you're good. Your building keeps running. Number two is to disable the schedule or change the time periods. So, right, we can go and we can change our time periods. We just go to our weekly schedule, you know, and we could change a time period. You can see it's it's relatively simple. It's different depending on what building automation system you work with, and if you're uncomfortable with this, you can reach out to your contractor, and they can help you out. But, you know, you could just go and change the schedules. So right here, you, you just kind of go and change them to whatever you want them to be. Um, you can also go and disable schedules. So let me just kind of click yes to that. And if we go, we can actually go into a schedule and we could go and disable it if we wanted to. But that's going to look different based on everyone's scheduling software. And the third option is, hey, um, delete. Just delete the schedule. Uh, I don't recommend doing this. I highly do not recommend doing this. This is like worst case scenario. There really should be no reason why you have to get to that point. Uh, you should just delete the actual um, or disable the schedule or change the time periods. This is like if you have a really old system and you can't for whatever reason, that that is an option. It is not an option I recommend. I even struggled whether I was going to put that in here or not, but I just want you to be aware that it exists. All right, alarming basics. So what is an alarm? So an alarm is an event-driven action that detects and alerts based on deviations from a normal state. So when we're dealing with alarms, we want to identify the alarms, right? We want to figure out what alarms we have, what are critical, which ones aren't critical. Um, we want to record what the normal states are. So if we're going to be disabling alarms or changing alarms, we want to go and record the state. So you know, if I go here and I look at this out of range alarm extension, I'm just going to make this big for a second. Uh, right here I can see, and this is, like I said, it's going to be different for everyone's software, okay? Uh, so we can see high limit and low limit. So this is a high limit and low limit alarm. So you don't even have to write all this down. You can take screenshots, whatever. Um, you could do a backup of your building automation system, which is something I'll talk about in just a little bit that I highly recommend. But get these values. Figure out what these are. Now, once you figure that out, right, you are going to have to, and I I did mess this up. Okay. Uh, you're going to record the normal state of the alarm. Then um, one way, right, to disable the alarms. Oh, no, I didn't mess this up. I'm talking to myself here. Uh, you're going to link to a global occupancy point. So you're going to create a global occupancy point, And that global occupancy point is then, let me see if I can show you this. Um, go here. And right here, you're going to have the ability. Let me see if we can pin some slots. I, I don't even know if they have an enable slot on here. I think I just take in. But uh, you would take a global occupancy point. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. Sorry about that, folks. Here we go. There we go. Yeah, 
yeah, they don't have it here. But um, I would have to add it. But what you could do is you could expose the alarm point. And when you expose the alarm point, you could expose if we go into the extension here, you'll see that there is an inhibit that you can expose. And there's actually an alarm enable that could be exposed. Now, this is, like I said, it's going to be different depending on people's software. So your software may not look like this. You may not have the ability to enable and disable alarms. But if you do, you can create a global schedule that is disabled, that writes to the alarm, and disables the alarm. Um, and you could do that for non-critical alarms. You can also go, right? Yeah, I know I need to composite, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just don't want to take the time to do that. So um, option one, link to the global occupancy. Option two, disable the alarm. And option three is ignore, delete the alarm. So these are kind of things that you can do. You're not going to do this for every alarm, um, but you are going to do this for the ones that are going to be non-critical. Remote building monitoring. All right. So. Remote building monitoring, we're using basically some a couple different types of systems in order to monitor. One is public IP. Um, this is going to be the least secure. So this is going to go kind of in order, not necessarily of security because it's perceived security. And the reason I say that is public IP can be just as secure as a VPN if you set it up right with the right things. If you do firewalls and all sorts of stuff, you can do things that will make you just as secure. Um, however, from an IT perspective, and that's all we care about here because that's who you have to get to approve you to use remote connectivity. From an IT perspective, they're going to view their VPN software as their most secure option. It doesn't matter that Tossie Box and Cradle Point are very secure options, arguably probably more secure than VPNs in some cases because a VPN is only sec as secure as it's properly implemented. But the problem is, is that the IT group is going to think that their solution is the most secure. That's just how they think. So ideally, you want to start with their software. So if I am you, I am starting with IT, talking about what software do you have that can remotely connect me to my BAS. If you have nothing, then I'm going to look at these guys right here, and I'm going to try to implement them because they're all in one solutions. I don't have to worry about setup really too much, and they're going to be pretty secure. And then if all else fails, I can use a public IP expose my BAS as long as I've got it set up securely. I know that's like horrible to say and, and everyone with cybersecurity background is cringing, but the reality is if you have to monitor a critical asset and you can't do these things and you can't physically be there, you just got to accept the risk. Uh, IT cybersecurity is all about understanding the risk and ex accepting the level of risk in exchange for what you need, which in our case is access, right? So if I think about what I need to do to set up remote access, right? It's step one, create connection policies and processes. So this is really important. And when I see folks starting to get into this, they don't think about this enough. They don't think about how are we going to connect remotely to the building? Are we going to use a laptop? Are we going to just uh, have everyone just be the wild, wild west and they're going to connect however they want, whenever they want? You got to think through this. This is actually where your cybersecurity will come from is by having a policy and process around we're not going to use the same computer to surf ESPN as we use to go and connect to our building. So we've got to have that. Then we've got to identify our systems to be monitored and controlled. The reality is for a lot of buildings, the BAS is not going to be connected to a network that can easily be remotely accessed. So we've got to figure out what systems on the BAS do we need to monitor and or control. And once we identify these, then we've got to connect them to the network. 
So we've got to figure out how are we going to connect them. Is that uh, working with your contractor to get some dual network interface cards and pull them into another LAN, you know, pull it into another local area network, whatever that is. Once we've done that, then we need to connect it to the outside network. And that's where we can use the VPN software, the Tossy Box, Cradle Point, Public IP, et cetera. And then we verify our connection. That's a pretty straightforward path to remote connectivity, but I've done it so many times I can't even keep count and it works really, really well. All right, so what slide are we on? We're on 22, I think that is going to be, yep. So that brings us to question and answer. I know we covered a ton and I tried to get us to where we would have like 25 minutes of question and answer time where I could just take your questions and answer basically any questions you had. I wanted to give you a lot of time. But uh, as I said, um, I really hope that this was helpful. I encourage you to implement what I have mentioned. I'm going to do something real quick. I'm just going to save this PowerPoint. Okay. And then I'm going to send you all the next power. I'm going to reattach it. So let me uh, we get that up real quick, and I'm going to reattach the new PowerPoint. There we go. But in the meantime, while I do that, uh, feel free to ask any questions. There we go. Okay, so what are my recommended environmental targets? Temp, air, temp humidity, air changes per day during an extended unoccupied period. Great question. Um, it depends on your environment. So you have to ask yourself, what kind of building do I have? What kind of environment do I have? If I am in you know, the Pacific Northwest where it's a relatively mild environment, doesn't get deep freezes, doesn't get too hot, then the typical you know, 5585 should carry you through. And I mean, unless you drop below 55 or go above 85, your systems aren't going to kick on and you're going to be fine. And you could do you know, a duty cycle depending on your interior environment. So... Obviously, a museum is going to keep running because you've got art and stuff like that that you have to maintain. But a commercial office building, you know, you may go and run uh, a cycle of air every hour. You may kick on, and this would be ventilation mode, which is an important point. Ventilation mode is completely different than mechanical cooling or mechanical heating mode. Ventilation is just an air flush. And so you may run an air flush every hour. You may run an air fl flush every four hours. Um, what I would be primarily focused on when I start to unoccupy my building is the first thing I would be focused on is obviously low temperature. In these months right now, I'd be focused on low temperature. The second thing I'd be focused on is high relative humidity. So low temperature and high relative humidity. Uh, low relative humidity is not going to be too terribly big of a deal. As long as you are not maintaining IT assets that are, you know, if you're in Arizona, then yeah, low humidity is going to be a big deal. But uh, the, for the rest of the U.S. at least, low humidity is not too big of a deal. But if you start to go above 75, 80% relative humidity in a building, uh, it's going to be important to bring that down because that's when you can start to damage walls. That's when you can start to warp wood. <coughs> Excuse me. So hopefully that helps you. And good question, by the way. Yeah, and Chad um, with Resolute Building mentioned that for hospitals, there's an ASHRAE standard on ventilation of healthcare facilities. There's also, um, I mean, ASHRAE 62.1, but that's more focused on a uh, breathable atmosphere for folks when they're actually in the building. Although it does give some nice thresholds on air changes within a space. However, realize that that is considering actually being occupied. So those air change values definitely change when a space is unoccupied. 
during a power failure, do you typically install UPS for all your BAS hardware and devices? It depends. So that's a really good question. So when I'm thinking about UPSs, I'm thinking about do my BAS devices already have battery backup on board? A lot of BAS devices these days have battery backup on board, and that allows... So basically what we're trying to have happen is the device giving time to shut down. Because here's the reality. A lot of folks are like, I got to keep a UPS up so that my controller has time to go and close the fan or close the dampers and da 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 da. Well, if you lost power in your facility, the power that's going to be driving the dampers is not going to be existent. So it doesn't matter if you have a UPS in your controller. It's not going to go and actually control any devices. That's kind of a misunderstanding. So when I use UPSs, it's just to allow any operations within the software that is currently happening happening to wrap up. So I'm looking for 30 seconds to a minute to allow that system to shut down. Um, most systems these days have onboard battery backups for that purpose. Um, when we used to use a lot of UPSs, this was more for the older systems that took a long time to do backups and actually had to send their backups up to a central server, but uh, that was mainly for legacy systems. All right, next question. Recommended steps and concerns if one is controlling a P3 healthcare facility. Um, run like normal. So any healthcare facility right now, run like a 24-7 facility. Have a critical equipment plan. Have a um, plan for if systems fail, how are you going to deal with that? Have product on stock for your common systems that may fail. Um, and also increase your maintenance checks. And if possible, uh, if you've got really good predictive analytics, implement those because that will really help you get ahead of the curve. Analytics these days are actually valuable. Um, I mean, five years ago, I would not be suggesting this, but we've gotten to the point now where analytics can actually predict equipment failure. Um, they used to be really sketchy in the past, but they can be accurate. I'm not going to recommend a analytics company. I'm not going to get into that. But uh, I definitely would encourage you, if you have a critical facility, they can be valuable. All right. When creating additional negative pressure rooms without an isolated exhaust? I don't understand the question. Um, so if you can repeat that. Yeah, and uh, Chad Rutch with Resolute Buildings is mentioning that uh, there are some ASHRAE documents that recommend uh, unoccupied settings. So definitely, uh, you can reach out to him on LinkedIn, C-H-A-D space R-U-C-H, and ask him to share those documents with you, or maybe he'll post them online on LinkedIn. Um <clears throat> I'm not going to get into any ASHRAE documents because typically some of them you have to pay for. Uh, so I'm just going to leave it to you all around there. I will say, I mean, common sense prevails when it comes to these things. If you live in a humid environment, you want to be cognizant of humidity. If you're in like 5,000 feet up in Denver, you may want to be concerned about freezing right now. If you're in, you know, Southern Texas, you may want to worry about heat buildup in a building. If you're in Arizona, you may want to be focused on low humidity. So, I mean, just understand your environment and realize the environmental effects on the interior of your building and just be cognizant of those and schedule those accordingly. Okay. Um, we've been asked to create additional isolation rooms to be used for COVID-19 but the concern that the return air from these rooms will contaminate the AHU. Yeah, standard practice for any isolation room is to have it be 100% outdoor air and exhaust with, I think it's like a 10-foot lift. I Don't quote me on this, but there's it's like a 10 or 15-foot lift that the exhaust has to be off the surface of the roof. Um, so that's the standard practice. Now... Um, I have seen folks do isolation rooms 
with mixed air units with dual uh, MERV filters in a row. Supposedly, MERV filters deal with this virus and they capture it. I don't know. I am not an expert on uh, filtration and its ability to deal with the virus. So I would defer to someone who is an expert in that. But uh, I've heard that you can do that in the past. And I've seen hospitals implement mixed air units with dual filters for isolation rooms. Uh, any shutdown concern about the utility demand response programs that have control of your HVAC or lighting? Yeah, shut them off. I mean, just basically disable that feature. I mean, I can't. So that's kind of my off the cuff response, right? Is to shut it off. What are they going to do? Get mad at me? Um, but in reality, yeah. Um, I mean, if you reached out to your local utility, I would be shocked that if they um, would go and raise a stink about that. I don't think that is on anyone's focal point right now. Uh, but that being said, I mean, never hurts to call them. I'm sure that there's plenty of people who have, would love to talk to you right now because they got nothing else to do. Uh, if you are completely shut down, cooling towers in the summer, are you exposing yourself to Legionelle possibilities? Good question. I'm not an expert on that. Uh, so I would defer to someone who is an expert on that. I know that with water treatment, you can limit, but that's not going to necessarily affect the water buildup on the inside of the walls due to evaporation. You could run your pumps so that you have circulation. I mean, that's the primary way of dealing with that. So that's a good question. But like I said, I'm not an expert on that. And Chad has volunteered to, uh, if you run a Niagara system, to demonstrate how to uh, log set points using be cool queries, which is basically uh, just a query. It's it's like any other query that you would do in most of your building automation systems where you search for set points and then you grab those data. Any other questions I can answer for anybody? My hope is that this was a good use of your time and I will remain here to uh, answer any questions you all have as we continue uh so yeah feel free to just type them in and i will go and answer any questions you have my goal here is that you'll feel more comfortable with the process of getting started on shutting down your building and uh you know you'll feel more comfortable with you know, how am i going to address this if you do feel uncomfortable, I encourage you to reach out to one of your building contractors. I'm sure they would be more than happy to help you with this. Um, don't freak out. It's something that has been done before, shutting down a building. And uh, if you follow these steps and you document your information and you make sure you're thorough, you'll be all right. Goal is not perfection. It's just progress. Um, great question. So what's a good control strategy for preventing against high humidity? Um, one is shutting down outdoor air. So you're not going to need outdoor air if the building's unoccupied. Um, that in itself will deal with a lot of humidity because most of the time your humidity is going to come from outside and it's going to come from respiration. So people are going to exhale, uh, exhale. <clears throat> sorry, my throat dried up there, exhale, and that's going to cause respiratory humidity. And then you're going to have humidity from outside. Um, those two humidity sources you can disable, right? You don't have people in the building and you turn off your outdoor air. You don't have minimum outdoor air because you don't need it anymore. So you circulate your air. 
And then if needed, you can bring on a partial load chiller in order to bring that air back down from uh, 80% to like a more manageable 60, 65% relative humidity. And we've got to remember, and this, oh, this is a really good point. I'm glad you asked this question because this is a really good point. I, I want to draw this out. Um, because a lot of folks forget this. So if we think about a psychrometric chart, right, and we think about our relative humidity, so this is, you know, absolute humidity over here, right? This is the amount of moisture in the airstream. As our temperature, as our dry bulb increases, like let's say we're 65 here, and then we're 70 here, and we're 75 here, and, you know, we've got our relative humidities, right? Actually, relative humidity wouldn't look like that. It would, it would look like this. Um, so we've got our relative humidity, right? And relative humidity is relative to the amount of moisture in the air. So be cognizant that if your space is 80 degrees and you're at 60% RH, that's going to be very different than 70 degrees at 60% RH. Because as the temperature goes up in your building, your ability to store moisture in the airstream increases. So 60% relative humidity at 80 degrees is substantially more moisture than 60% relative humidity at 70 degrees. So our goal here is to pick whatever threshold we want. Maybe it's 75, 70, maybe it's 80, 60, whatever it is, and not let it go above that point. And once we go above that point, then we enable our mechanical cooling to start to wring out that air. That makes sense? Okay, good. All right. What else can I answer for you all? We've got about eight more minutes. What might that look like in a sequence of operation? Yeah, 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 sir. So um, if I were coding that, so I would, you know, I would do like, uh, Take an or, an or block, and a greater than, and a greater than. So I would say, um, and then, oops, double clicked on that. Sorry about that. Move this or block down here. Um, and what I would do, and I'll draw because I, I just don't feel like bringing all these blocks together, but I'd have like zone temp zone temp set point and then i'd have rh and rh set point and what i would say is if rh is greater than rh set point and zone temp is greater than zone set point um so if if either of these are true right so if zone temp is greater than zone temp set point and remote or RH is greater than zone temp set point or zone temp set point is greater, either of these conditions, then I drive occupancy. So that's that's how I would do it. If you don't have relative humidity sensors in your zone or in your air handler return stream, uh, get them. Uh, because I, unless you like absolutely can't get to your facility, um, one way you could deal with this. So so let's say you don't have um, you don't have return air humidity or um, zone humidity. 
you could set a timer and every hour, or you could set a schedule that repeats every hour. Um, and you could have it enable mechanical cooling uh, anytime zone temp goes above 70. And you could have it enable mechanical cooling for 15 minutes every four hours. And that should flush any humidity out. Because, um, yeah. So this makes a good case for having return air humidity going forward. Because, I mean, it's a $200 sensor to buy and install. And you, you put it in place and you wire it up and then you map it in and kind of edit the sequence accordingly. This, this is probably going to be, if I were a betting man, six hours of time on site for them to come to the site, install the sensor, wire it up, test it, validate it, add it to the graphics, uh, four to six hours of labor plus material. Less the question, I work in a school district and we we're told to run our buildings 24-7. I created a special event for a month for each schedule. Is there a better way? No, that's a great way, James. That is a wonderful way. Special event that feeds into all of your schedules. That's actually the way I recommended. Remember, um, I said that I recommend using a special event that then you can delete later and your schedules go back to normal. I wonder why the heck they want to run their buildings 24-7. That's kind of interesting. But um, I mean, other than that, yeah, that's a perfect way of doing it. Return to air humidity would only be reliable if the unit is on. Yes, you're absolutely right. It is ideal to use zone humidity, but that's going to be more costly to install because of the wire pool. So I typically recommend return air humidity. And during your flush, you will get that return air humidity sensor. Now, granted, to your point, you could have an issue where return air humidity builds up depending on where that duct is um, because of just that static air that just sitting there. But you can disable that as part of the uh, unoccupancy sequence. There's all sorts of things that we're all going to have to think about a little bit different as we go doing uh, these sequence changes. The important point is to back up your existing sequences before you make these changes and then go and um, make the changes so that you can roll back your backups uh, once this is all over. The worst thing you can do is make the changes and not back up your code before you make the changes and then try to remember what the heck was done. Great questions, folks. I'm loving these. These are like real world problems solving. This is this is good stuff. So what else can I answer for you all? I see there is still uh, a fair bit here. If you're already due to duty cycling, which for those of you who don't know what duty cycling means, um, Basically, that's where we're turning, that's like ventilation mode, right? Flush mode, where we're turning it on, we're running it, we're letting it run for a little bit, and then we're turning it off. It's called a duty cycle. Um, so if you're already duty cycling, could you use your return air humidity to trigger a longer mechanical cooling process? So if the RH is above X, continue running mechanical cooling until RH is below X. Yeah, that's basically like a modified trim and response sequence, right? So you, you have trim and response. Um, and then if uh, you, you check like you have a timer every 15 minutes or every five minutes, and if that uh, timer after, you know, five minutes, um, if it uh, is still like, if um, I'm using zone humidity just because I already started to write that, but I know you said return error. Um, but if that's greater than your set point, um, if, if that's still true, then you know you just add it you add or you keep it enabled something like that I, I would have to think through the code but basically a trim and response sequence would work um because basically trim and response looks at zones and it says hey if um 
trim if you have a zone that's outside of settings then um, you add typically it's for pressure or temperature reset but we could use it basically for this uh, chad said there's a good trim and response document um why does that keep popping up that you can go to i've read that as well on the taylor engineering site where it talks through uh trim and response and how to work it so uh taylor engineering uh ashray journal trim and response if the name of the sensor does not indicate the equipment to which it is connected is there a way to figure it out without going to the site um it depends on what the sensor is so if let's say it's a dat sensor right um and you think it's for air handler one but you're not sure if you turn on the fan and turn on the cooling and that dat sensor starts to decrease then you've started to kind of figure it out so there's that way it gets a little harder when it zones um because you know if you have one air handler you could influence multiple zones but in that case, you can shut a zone. Um, you can shut its damper and start to see the temperature increase in there. So you got to think whenever I'm trying to troubleshoot, because uh, you used to have to do this a lot in the legacy control days um, because stuff didn't have their naming files. But if I'm trying to troubleshoot what a sensor goes to, I think about the process loop, right? So if I draw out a process loop, um, all right, so I've got temp right this is this is t for temp and what controls the temp in the space well it's the airflow right so i've got my my damper this is my really bad example of a damper it's my damper output which is going to deliver cool air to the space so if i shut off this damper in theory the space should start to heat up so i would figure out that oh it's this damper is related to this temp. And that's how I start to figure out these points. So um, that's how I go and figure all this out. All right. Okay, Harry says, just a comment that some facilities are not allowed to start all the equipment at once after it's been shut down due to power overload. That's a very good point. There's this thing called demand peaks and ratchet charges. And basically, like if you think about it, let's just use like 10KW. We're just going to say 10KW. I mean, we're just using broad numbers. And let's say that's your ceiling. Well, what you'll tend to do, because when equipment turns on, it surges, it it has a large amount of kw that it draws and then it kind of lowers down well if you bring everything up at once you're going to go and go above this curve and let's say you go to 15 kw when you go up well now that's your new ceiling and so when you turn stuff on you'll gradually stage it on so that oh i'm on oh i'm on oh i'm on and so it's called staging of equipment and that way you stay below this curve right here. So that's something to be cognizant of for some of you. How do I communicate these new strategies to building owners who might be skeptical of any changes in set point because of mold concern, concerns uh, and reassure them and myself? I'm not a mold expert. Um, I'm not an IAQ expert. I am a controls expert and I understand uh, temperature and I understand control and I understand the effects of things. But at what point in humidity does mold start to occur? I'm not an expert on that. You would have to search that up. But if you are able to find that out and you don't go above those thresholds, then in theory, mold is not going to occur. In theory, you're not going to start to warp wood floors. In theory, you're not going to start to damage drywall. Um, so while I can't give you the exact numbers for that, because that's not my area of expertise, I definitely can tell you that these control modes will work to achieve 
whatever set point threshold you decide to achieve. Uh, do I typically see in AHU sequences that invoke fire protection in an event fire dampers fail? Do I typically what I I don't understand the question, sorry. Are you asking what do I see in air handler sequences that involve fire protection smoke dampers? Um, and what happens if those dampers fail? Um, well, typically it'll trip the high or low static depending on where the damper is. So if the damper is downstream, then it's going to trip the high static because you're going to have an airflow pressure buildup that's going to back up the ductwork and it's going to trip the high static. Um, typically for fire protection, what I see with air handlers is smoke. I see smoke detection where the fan command is ran through the normally closed contacts on the smoke detector so that if that smoke detector triggers, it automatically disables the fan command. Typically for fire dampers, I don't see much other than maybe a dry contact from the fire system saying that there's a fire to shut down air handlers. All right, folks, anything else I can answer for you all? Uh, there will be a recording that will be emailed out. Feel free. Uh, I'll also be sharing the recording on our YouTube page as well as on our webinars on our website. I'll hang around a couple more minutes in case any of you all have questions. Um, really hope this was a good use of your time. I thank you for uh, showing up. I know that this is kind of a concerning time for a lot of us. Hopefully this uh, just made your life a little bit easier.